Hello and welcome to My Mom's Basement, ladies and gentlemen. I am here with one of my idols, Nikki Six. His book, The First 21, How I Became Nikki Six, is out now. I just checked my uh, tracking number online. It's going to get here tonight, so I'm excited about that. And I wanted to tell you, this is very cool for me because your first 21 actually influenced my first 21 quite a bit. You are the reason that I play bass. And I actually, when I first got my bass, decided I need a Thunderbird like Nikki Six, even Look though it was it. twice the size of me. Look at that. That's <laughs> right. The, the birds are big, aren't they? Huge. So heavy. Yeah. Oh, my God. My parents were like, is this really the bass that you picked? Like, you got to yeah, carry you this Yeah, you should have got like a little, little you know, beginner bass. But there you go. Well, I, I'm sure your finger, you have a nice stretch on your fingers. Yeah, you I got that. I got the fretboard stretch and all that. Yeah, thanks yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah a friend of mine. Saints of Los Angeles. That intro oh, to that wow. song, I was like, man, I got to learn that. I want to play this. My brother was a drummer, obsessed with Tommy his whole life, raised me to be a crew head. And I was yeah. like, you and me are going to be Tommy and Nikki. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Now, I was someone that read The Dirt, and some of your upbringing is covered in The Dirt. I want to yeah. know, how much did your perspective or the lens you were looking through your childhood in the first 21 yeah. change since 2001 when you wrote that book? Well, I mean, you know, it, it's been this uh, evolution from especially starting with uh, the heroin diaries, because The Dirt was what it was at that time in my life and uh but it was like during the like writing in the heroin diaries i started realizing a lot of of uh things that felt like they just didn't feel right and they, they came out in anger and resentment and things about my family and things that happened to me and the story was pretty simple my mom told me you know she was a perfect mom and your dad abandoned me and your sister and your grandparents stole me from uh, uh, stole me from her because she was so young. That's the story that I got to carry around my suitcase. And, you know, it didn't really connect with me, to be honest with you. And what I discovered in the book was, you know, that's not the only part of my story like that. Yeah, stuff happens, man. And it's kind of like, what do you do with that stuff? And for a long time, long time like when it really came out I was just like well the way I deal with it is through anger or you know uh, turning a blind eye to it and but going back in the writing of this book discovered a lot of discrepancies it was like it's like a mystery like my, my family it's like a mystery so like trying to get like my sister to open up about stuff that was painful for her. And then my aunt and my uncle who were there when I was actually born telling me different stories uh, than I had heard from my mom, you know, and then able to sort of look at like what it was uh, to be my mom. She ran away from home at 13 years old, showed up at 17 pregnant with me and my dad, who was 40. When he 58, that's like, the atomic yeah. bomb going off, especially in some of these small towns. So, um, you know, like what did she deal with in 1960 when my sister was born with Down syndrome? She had a, a, a two-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old at that time. My sister wasn't supposed to live six months. And something was off. And I remember talking to my aunt and uncle, and it's in the book where Bob, my uncle Bob, who's 90 now, said something happened that made your dad really mad and we kind of started lining up the uh well putting the piece of the puzzle together and my sister was put into a home and i'm really happy for her that she got to live her life out with a family and that took care of other children with downs um that that's fantastic but i think with my dad being uh pure Sicilian, you know, all Italian family, proud males, like almost the cliche. Um, that was the deal breaker for him. He didn't want my sister to go, his daughter to go anywhere. And I think that was that in combination with that and uh, that my mom was uh, a bit of a, of a little wild, um, a little wired differently. Um, I think that was an explosive moment. But that's not pure abandonment, like as I carried on, right? But he still left somebody behind, being me, yeah. and I still get to look at that. But empathetically, in this book, 
And I didn't want to get tangled up in just the family story uh, in the writing of the book. I, I really wanted to expose that and talk about that. So maybe other people uh, that have gone through family issues can like maybe see some tools that I later applied to it. But it was the book is to me really about the coming of age and discovery of music. And then what did I do with that? How did I get how did I get here? I mean, I still scratch my head every day and it's like, how did I get to be in like one of the biggest bands in rock and roll when that's all I dreamed about as a 13, 14 year old kid in Idaho? Like there's no chance in hell from Jerome, Idaho, sitting in a park with a bicycle and a dream and a Black Sabbath record, you're ever going to be in Motley Crue, what the hell happened, dude? So it's kind of like this book does kind of show like the work ethic, the strategy, the way my brain works. And the um, other thing that a lot of people don't talk about, which is luck. Absolutely. Everybody gets a lucky break. Yeah. People hopefully get a few lucky breaks in life. My two things happened to me. One is I fell in love with like you, you fall in love with bands, want to play bass and uh, becomes a part of who you are and part of like what drives you and what you enjoy in life, gives you pure joy to uh, music does or art or whatever it is you're into. Um, I was young and uh, having a hard time being in a small town and we discovered this, uh, this stuff called marijuana nice. and beer marijuana and beer sometimes boone's farm wine you probably don't never even, i don't even know if that's around no I don't, i've never heard of it yeah you don't want to um <laughs> <laughs> it's like drinking uh, uh pollution but um i my grandparents didn't know what to do with me they were the sweetest most loving unconditional loving taking care of me blue collar hard working double wide trailer living didn't know the difference of anything. I had a, a rock to skip on the lake and a stick that I could, you know, pretend was my sword and a bicycle. And um, they didn't know what to do. So my mom kind of reappeared in my life and said, you know, Frankie can come um, to Seattle. I mean, and talk about the moment. I'm sure. Because I found other kids, I had I had friends and stuff. We talked about that in Jerome, and that was a big part of uh, discovering music through my friends. But uh, Seattle was a whole other kettle of fish, and we're now going to see Deep Purple. We're going to see Led Zeppelin. We're going to go see a uh, uh, trip. One of my favorite shows is a triple bill. I think Kansas was headlining. I think. Rush was in the middle, and I think Queen was the opening band. It might have been the other way around, but Rush was the, I mean, K Kansas was the headliner. And I had really, like, fallen for Queen. And I think they had just put out their third album, Sheer Heart Attack, which means they had uh, Killer Queen on that album. And that was just this time when I had friends and going to concerts and learning to play and I ended up back in Idaho, um, working on a farm again, you know, saving money to get a guitar. And I had another stroke of luck. This one, I think better than Seattle, is that my uncle invited me to Los Angeles to stay in guest house and got me a job at uh, Music Plus in Glendale, California, and let me borrow his like 70s F-150 pickup truck. And... I am now seeing things that I only heard about and meeting other people that re I mean, there was the sunset strip in the seventies and started playing and started yeah. like auditioning for bands. So, so I, I owe a lot to my uncle for just bringing this young dweeby kid <laughs> from Idaho with an idea but I, I wasn't fully flushed out yet, the idea. It's just, it was this passion. 
do you have a most memorable show that you played from that first 21? I know that this book covers a lot of London, your band before yeah, Motley. Yeah, is yeah. there one that sticks out for better or for worse? Like, oh, that was the worst show ever. That was the best show ever where you're like, that is the one that sticks out in my brain. Well, London was really the band where, where I got like time under the hood being on stage. And one of the most magical moments, I've had them with Motley Crue too, was we rehearsed and we rehearsed and we rehearsed. We had Nigel Benjamin on the lead vocals, who was a five octave singer. Mata uh, Hoople, Brit. right? Huh? He's from Mata Hoople, right? Yeah, that's right. Mott yeah. Mot and then British Lions. So we had our songs, we sounded like Queen meets T-Rex and Bowie. We had this like crazy singer and I just was like, this is it. This yeah. is what I heard on the radio. This is what I heard on vinyl records that my uncle would send me. He would send me like Wings, Paul McCartney and Wings. And then I'm, all of a sudden I'm in this band that has elements of stuff like that in it. And we had four shows sold out. And it was one of the best magical performances, if not the best for that band. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. The audience knew it. The people, the backstage knew it. Everybody knew that we're, this is it. And my uncle had come to see us. And I called him the next day because I thought he was going to sign us. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, you know, I just, you know, I love you, and but I don't see it. And I was like, wait a minute. What do you, don't, what do you mean you don't see it? Did you see all the people? Did you see? And he's like, it's just not right for us. And, you know, being in the music industry for 40 years and understanding how it works and understanding how label executives have to deal with quarterly billing and how it is a business, it's not show family. I realized that London, as great as we were that night, that magical night, was not what was right for a record company. They needed to sign the Go-Go's, the Knack, they needed to sign the Plimsolls. They needed to sign new wave-ish bands, which, you know, I, I look back and I'm like, you know, those songs weren't bad, but at the time they were the perceived enemy. Of course. Like the heavier we can be, the nastier we can be, the more politically incorrect. Like, we don't want to be that. That's like, that's like our parents' music. <laughs> like we literally would think that, even though it was the hottest, the hottest ticket, you know? Yeah. Um, that moment, I will never forget. And the next morning when I called my uncle Don and he said, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I learned a lot about myself in my own book, which is, I just don't take no for an answer. And I went to band rehearsal. I said, I got great, 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 great. The best news ever. And they're like, oh my God. Okay. What is it? I go, we got the same songs. We've defined our stage show. We've got the coolest state. Everything is there. I go, and then, and then what's the bad news, says Nigel. I said, you know, the record company passed, but who cares? I mean, we'll do it anyway. And he yeah. said, well, in that case, I quit. Another stroke of luck. Devastation winning from like, we had the most perfect night. And, to the, my uncle, the president of Capitol Records is going to sign us to we're not going to sign you, which I didn't care. And then the lead singer quits, unreplaceable lead singer. We tried, but it was just no one could compete with that voice. And um, I was forced to start a new band. And that new band wound up becoming Motley Crue. It's an unbelievable story. Like you said, it's like a little bit of luck involved in there. Yeah. And you have one of the biggest rock and roll bands of all time. It's crazy. What if Nigel, what if Nigel stayed? Would yeah. we have what been... if he had the same attitude as you? Yeah. Yeah. Would, would we be huge? Or would we have just been falling between the cracks? I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And, but it's fun to look at that. And the book helped me connect to my family and to old band members, mm -hmm. ex-girlfriends, you know, in a way where it's like they were able to kind of share hey, what was it like being with a 17 year old version of myself and having some photos, which were really, I really appreciate that people that had stuff still laying around 
um, my old library card from the 70s. Oh, wow. I mean, it's just it's like in the scrapbook, it's just uh, what we did is we formed two scrapbooks inside the book because we wanted it to feel like, you know, if you're young, you might scrapbook a little bit mm-hmm. or cut things out and piece them together and put them on your wall. So we kind of gave some of that uh, graphic design uh, to the book. So, um, you know, it was like asking people like, hey, do you got any pictures? Like when I like, it's kind of a little dweeby, you know? <laughs> and they're like, you know, I don't know. It was so hard finding uh I'm photo sure, yeah. just many years down the road. No, when I had an iPhone back then, but my uncle had an eight millimeter camera and he always was filming I think I remember as a kid, like them putting a sheet on the wall and with a projector. Oh, yeah. And there was no sound to it. It was just like magic. You know, I was like, this is, this is, looks like magic. So he documented all that stuff. And we found in their garage in Boise, Idaho, um, we found boxes and boxes and boxes of eight millimeter film and negatives and my cousins and my, my whole family. And that really, really helped. But one of my favorite photos is uh, I'm with my first girlfriend um, Susie and we're both like 13 14 years old and uh, I remember that my grandfather would not let me grow my hair out and he's like you know when I grew up everybody had a flat top and you're gonna have one too and I'm like but have you seen Steven Tyler like (laughs) you know have you seen Keith Richards like you know and yeah um, my grandmother was like, leave, leave, leave him alone. Like he works his ass off. He, he's a good kid. Just before I discovered marijuana. <laughs> um, and uh, so I started to get to grow my hair out. I don't know. I just wanted to share that with people because I think like back then, a lot of people can relate to like their parents were like kind of controlling their image yeah. and from a different perspective. Like yeah. they're looking at it through like the filter of the 1940s and 50s. Like, of course, Keith Richards looks like the devil, you know, <laughs> which is why I liked it. Yeah. Um, so I was growing my hair out. Not a good phase. Kind of like trying to get the bangs along. The whole thing. When you're trying to grow it out, that's always the worst. You got to go it's like the hat worst. for a while. Yeah. You got to, yeah, <laughs> yep. I'm going to be a hat guy for a while. Yep. I know. I, I get that even now. I'll cut all my hair off and then I grow it long. I cut it off. I'm like, okay, I'm wearing a hat for a year. Yep. Exactly. Um, so the other thing, and then all of a sudden came the, the horrible news of I needed glasses. Now, mm. Um, in 1970s, being a teenager and being told you need glasses is a whole lot different than saying it now because glasses are cool and <laughs> there are cool glasses and, uh, y- you know, but then it was like, okay, I, I need these glasses. So we drove to Twin Falls, Idaho, across the Snake River, which is such a part of the book, the story in the snake. Um, and I found these glasses. I was like, Wow. I go, they look like Elvis. And I had my, my, my bowl cut. And like, I got some like sh- shirt that I thought was kind of cool. Might've had some, some design in it. So I'm like thinking like, I'm the bee's knees. I got a girlfriend. Like we're in the discovery of music. And I, we find this picture of me and my girlfriend, Susie. I look like a, look like a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, I'm Jeffrey Dahmer man I'm, I'm all of them all rolled into one um good name for a serial killer Frank Ferrana yeah you know? yeah I could it's not bad uh, yeah. this rock thing doesn't work it's catchy out. you know yeah so I think it's funny following your first 21 years because we have these awkward phases and discovery phases and uh I don't know. I I don't enjoy when I read uh, memoirs or or see even see documentaries. And it's like you know, I was born, and then next thing you know, I was selling out. You know, Madison Garden. I agree. And oh yeah, like we are started. Like we invented rock and roll. And I'm like, okay, I know you actually had a big impact, but what was it like when you didn't quite have it figured out yet? Because that's what we need to hear. 
I agree. How did you learn to write songs? Like what influenced you and, and how did you apply that? And so we talk a lot about all the different genres that were happening in, happening in the 70s and how I was able to kind of just naturally blend mm -hmm. parts of them that I liked, applying image to that, stage production to that. And I'm like, wow, that was like a recipe for, for Motley Crue. Absolutely. Like pre, pre Motley Crue. Yeah. You know, just Motley Crue like ran on like jet fuel and London was running on gas. You know? <laughs> it's and, a good and way to put good. it. Yeah. Yeah. And that Motley Crue, I'm forever grateful to, you know, what a, a lucky break, you know, how, luck again, uh, meeting Tommy, Vince and Mick. And I, they changed my life and hopefully I helped also change their life. And we did something as a four of us that um, I'm was 40 years together. What the hell are we still doing together? Yeah. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, I don't <laughs> get it. We even try to break up. We can't break up. I it's know. Like, I remember your reunion in, in 05 was like, oh my God, me and my brother watching that on the news. If I die tomorrow, music video coming out, like yeah. all of that was I mean, that was like, I grew up on that. And speaking of Motley, I saw your interview on Adam Carolla's show yesterday, and okay. you corrected him when he referred to you as a lead singer. Um, yes. With tracks like Rocket Ship and Find Myself, I yeah. got to ask, is there any reason why you never had a project where you were the lead singer? Um, about, uh, well, before the pandemic, I started, I got into this like lesson thing. So I started taking guitar lessons online, Oh, wow. I just plunk away on the guitar and I can write an okay song on guitar, but um, I don't know a lot about the instrument other than I like to write from root notes. So chords, simple chords and all the susses and all the interchangeable notes that work within that chord. I don't have a ton of knowledge. I can kind of pick, figure it out. So I started taking uh, guitar lessons online, then eventually in person. I started taking bass lessons online, eventually in person. And then I was like pushing myself to play with my fingers. So even the song uh, on the uh, the Dirt soundtrack, all yeah. those songs I played with my fingers. Wow, the that's first crazy time. to me. Yeah, first time. And it was, took some adjustments with audio because I'm an aggressive pick player. Of course, yeah. You had to like get like some nice bite and put some distortion pedals in there and blend them in a little bit. Um, and then I said, well, you know, while I'm at it, why don't I just take vocal lessons? So I'll be a better background singer. And when I'm writing songs, I'll be able to have uh, easier to explain to the actual singer or whoever I'm co-writing with. And um, I was surprised at the range that I had, uh, but it was like a little bit in the lower register, but, that, but I like to sing more of like a falsetto-y Thing, like with rocket ship which kind of leans on mark bolin um and you know i just i just got to this place where i just like i don't have a lot i don't have enough years under the hood i don't have a lot of control over my voice so i'm like you know i seem to have been almost sold over 100 million records with this like crackly old thing i got now so i kind of like let that go for some reason i might have just gotten busy and that would all gone bye bye with the pandemic anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think of myself as a singer, um, but I'll do background vocals. And if it's in, the, and, and what I learned about my voice is if I'm in the right key, I actually have some strength. Mm -hmm. um, so, certain songs like Too Fast for Love, the background vocals is perfect for me. It's kind of a shout, like there's a melody in there a little bit, but it's pretty pretty punk rock um that no problems in there at all other songs like girls 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 it's it's like harder for me of course uh, yeah. to hit some of those notes so yeah the things that you learn about and the things you decide like is that an important thing for me right now i will never be a solo artist i don't want to be a solo artist i'm not interested in solo artists i'm a band member or a project person and the idea of I don't know, putting out a solo record where like I'm singing and I mean, that I guess maybe n never say never, maybe someday, maybe I'll want to do something like that. But now I'm more interested in the concept of um, a book, an album, 
a comic book, a movie, an animated series. Nice. How do we connect all this and do all these different things uh, within what we already know? And I think what that gives you is a reason to keep pushing on. Yeah. A project that I'd love to ask you about that I'm fascinated with is the 58 album, Diet for a oh. New America. My yeah. brother loves that album. He's always been like, I need a new 58 album. What do yeah. you like look back on that as and what was the inspiration behind that? It's such a unique project. You can hear my Lou Reed in there and Diamond Dogs in there, but also David Darling, who uh, was a guitar player and producer on that. Uh, you can hear his R&B and his funk. So it was like James Brown with like, like Bukowski narration with him doing crazy background uh, vocals. So it was like, I don't know what it was. Some people said, you know, it was so pre that everyone was like, what is this? And a lot of people said like, oh, now I hear it sounds like a modern record. Yeah, it sounds I like think it does. Like it would come out now. Uh, some great songs on there, like Shopping Card Jesus. And, and a lot of that was poetry. Uh, a lot of it was poetry. Dave, Dave would say, look, um, I, I, put a, I put a beat together around that riff that we were working on yesterday. And like, just like go in and just uh, grab one of your notebooks and just start telling me a story. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was inspirational and exciting. And just so outside the box, right? Yeah. And, and I, you know, I got to say to people out there, and don't be don't be afraid to fail like it's okay like you know this is was something i did for me and if somebody else enjoy you tell me how much your brother loves it that's fantastic i also love it and then um you know you just have to do what you love and then the mothership motley crew always comes first yeah and always is on I'm not going to do a 58 sounding song in Motley Crue because the audience won't understand, but I can on my own do that or LA rats or 6am or brides of destruction or write books. Um, just signed a deal with a huge director for an animation company. We're going to form and working on a children's book with my wife. Um, so, and how is music involved in that? Like what else yeah. is involved in all that stuff? But Motley Crue is and will always be the mothership. For As it sure. should be. As I've it got, should be. I've got one final question for you. Okay. This is a question that I ask every musician that comes on my show. Okay. Um, Noel Gallagher of Oasis once said he's pretty much summed up everything he ever wanted to say with rock and roll star, live forever, and cigarettes and alcohol. Mm. If you were to pick three songs that summed up everything you ever wanted to say, which would you select from your career? Wow, because there's like so many layers to the onion yeah so it's like you know I mean, you so that. many projects as you just mentioned there's so many you know, yeah 6 a.m motley yeah rise of destruction and i was just thinking motley so thanks for bringing that up um well i think life is beautiful that's the first yeah. one that came to mind for me yeah yeah and and i've seen people with tears in their eyes when we play that or holding up the book and putting their hand up and it's like i i can relate i, I hear a lot about that like it it was like an eye opener about re, uh, sobriety and recovery being a positive, not being, well, you're in trouble. You're in a timeout now because you did too many drugs and drank. It's like not a timeout. This is the, like the luckiest break I ever got was hitting the bottom so that now I could like do other stuff in my life. Life's beautiful. Home sweet home. Yep. You know, just uh, very. That was on Tommy's list. I had Tommy on the show and that was on really? his list. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, we got the, we had that. That's good um and uh was it three yeah well you know god that's hard you know because live wire just was like a statement out of the box uh but things like primal scream was a personal it's my thing. favorite motley song yeah you're yeah one of mine too i, I really enjoy that one why do I only get three? What kind of rules? What is this? <laughs> I don't know. I don't it's the like Oasis rules. rules. You could pick a couple others. The Oasis rules. <laughs> okay. The well, let, let's change. Let's let's add one more. Um, yeah, the Mount Rushmore. We could call it then. <laughs> the Mount Rushmore. Okay. Great. We're probably gonna get in trouble just for saying Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
why that interview never run because they mentioned mount rushmore <laughs> <laughs> um there's just been so many magical moments you know live wire is a really important song it's the first song we ever did as a band it's a great scene in the dirt too i love that scene in the movie oh yeah and that song comes from a lot of different places some of those moments we've talked about with the young anger around my parents and stuff i didn't even know and there's some kind of references to some abuse in there yet like throwing it right back in people's face and it just was it's like it's like the song that i think you could say even if you're a, a younger fan and maybe you haven't made it back to too fast for love yet you're like on the greatest hits or something uh defined us yeah absolutely tommy's list if you're curious was wild side girls 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 and home sweet home you know i wanted to go wild side but i figured tommy would do that I just wanted... <laughs> you know him too well <laughs> i know him too well no that's a good list too but now we have you got to call him back because we have the the four we need four we need yeah, one yeah. more i need one tommy. more from him yeah i'm gonna give you one for tommy okay Tommy uh, would pr might say "Find Yourself." Oh, he yeah, great! One. Loves that song. He's it's always like, hey, "Want to play that song live?" And I'm like, "Man, I don't want to sing." <laughs> <laughs> Dude, stadium tour. Let's go. Find yourself live. <laughs> we played it before live. We Which opened tour our did show. You do that on? Oh, I think it was Generation Swine tour. Yeah. It's out there. I love that album, by the way. Generation it's, Swine. It's I think that's album. the most underrated Motley album out there. Yeah. You know, awesome. a lot of times when you are a uh, band, you have to figure out how to navigate, uh, you know, evolution. Yeah. And um, sometimes it just doesn't connect. You know, Bowie, one of my, it's like Bowie's one of my dudes. But when he did those albums like Low and uh, some of that stuff in Berlin and uh, was with Iggy Pop. I was so young. I remember being in a record store. And I was like, what happened? Mm -hmm. Like now I look back on it and I go, okay, I get it. And I understand like he was going through his stuff. And he needed to express that. So sometimes fans will say like what happened or, and then find it later. Yeah. I At think the it's time, good. do you think people just wanted a more like motley sound with Vince back in the band? I, I think so. To be honest with you. Well, I'll tell you what how many years later and it sounds amazing it's another one that i feel like sounds like it could be a modern record i love all the industrial influence in that and nikki yeah. i really appreciate all the time this has Thanks, been awesome man. for me i'm really Thanks. excited to dig into the book and everyone check it out now nikki six the first 21 right. thanks man bye